Welcome to Calvary Church with Skip Heitzig. We're so glad you've joined us today. In Paul's letter to the Colossians, he declares that Jesus holds everything together, from the majestic to the microscopic and everything in between, work and family, friendships and faith. In this series, Pastor Skip explores the practical application of Jesus' preeminence so we can make sure that Jesus is at the center of it all. Always only Jesus, you uh, turn in your Bibles to the book of Colossians chapter 1? Last week we covered two verses, uh, the introduction to this book, and we continue uh, in verse 3. A couple of words of announcement uh, as we begin. You saw the announcement on Calvary College. Uh, we also have an elementary school a couple years ago when we saw the very disturbing trends in our culture. They've been there for a while, but Uh, We saw them sort of ramping up against our kids. And the truth of the matter is, is that children today are shaped by the culture rather than by their parents' values or by the church. Now, 4% of Generation Z, Gen Z kids, only 4% have a biblical worldview. So we know that the assault in the secular world and in public education is such that we wanted to do something about it. We've had a preschool that's done so well, and we have a, an elementary school. Uh, if um, you are interested, we're taking applications currently for um, kindergarten through third grade. We're taking them until August 5th. You can go to calvarychurchelementary.com for more information or to uh, submit that application. And then every now and then I like to make this uh, announcement that we don't view our event on Sunday as while we worship and then we do Bible study. This is also part of worship. We are worshiping God by being attentive to His Word. Therefore, we ask people once they're seated to stay seated, not move around, not decide in the middle, I'm out of here, I'm going. We're going to pray in a moment. Heads are going to be bowed. Some of your eyes are going to be closed. So you could move to a very strategic get-out-the-door-quick position if you're thinking you, you, you might do that. So well, we just like to keep the focus not on anyone but the Word of God. So um, to avoid that, we give you that in love announcement. Uh, let's pray together. Father, thank you for your Word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you that we are anchored to it because it is the lifeline that anchors us to the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is preeminent in this book, and the one, Lord, who is preeminent in our lives. Father, we pray that you would open up our ears and eyes, hearts, to the message of your word, and we would be changed because of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, some of the greatest men and women who have ever lived on this earth have been Christians, and we enjoy their legacy, all of the central values and institutions that we cherish in Western civilization, whether it's representative democracy or the abolition of slavery or compassion for the weak or the dignity and equality of women or the education of the young, or the rights of workers for fair pay, or health care, the introduction of hospitals by Christians in the 6th century, or prison reform, all of them have their roots in people who are followers of Jesus Christ. The ancient world was cruel. It was uh, sadistic. It was autocratic. It was filled with slavery. It deprecated the role of women. Christianity came in, brought new values, new ethics, because people now believed that all men were created equal and are in the image of God. And that system elevated every society that it penetrated. 
Also, some of the greatest thinkers and scientists have also been ardent Christians. People like Sir Francis Bacon, Copernicus, Johann Kepler, Galileo, Rene Descartes, Robert Boyle, Sir Isaac Newton, Pascal, Michael Faraday, Kelvin, Louis Pasteur, on and on and on. The noted historian from Yale University, Kenneth Scott LaTourette, once said, speaking of the influence of Jesus Christ, he said, through him, that is through Jesus, movements have been set in motion which have made in society for what mankind believes to be its best, gauged by the consequences which have followed the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ have been the most important events in the history of man. Measured by his influence, Jesus is central in the human story. This is so stark that even Dinesh D'Souza in his great book, What's So Great About Christianity, said even the atheists should say, thank God for Christianity. But what makes Christians so great is not their scientific achievements, it's not their social contributions, it's not their philosophical advancements. What makes Christians so great? Well, that is the theme of the paragraph that we're about to look at. It is what is going on in the life of his people transformed by the gospel message. Now, we're going to look at verse 3 through verse 8, six verses. Six verses in the English Bible. In the Greek language, it's one long sentence. My My language teacher would never let me get away with that, but this is Paul the Apostle, and it's Greek, so uh, that's how it is written. One long sentence because it forms a thought. So let's begin in verse 3, where he is giving thanks. We give thanks to God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your Love for all the saints because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit, as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. As you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. Paul begins by saying, thank God. Now remember, this letter was written from jail. Paul is a prisoner in Rome. Anytime anyone from jail is thankful for anything, it's noteworthy. And Paul is often want to do those kinds of things. See, it's one of the great features of Paul the Apostle. No matter what is going on in his life personally, no matter what pain or incarceration he is experiencing, or for that matter, what's going on in the church of Colossae, like all that weird false teaching, he can always find something to thank God for. We noted that last week. Yes, there are false doctrines and there are false believers, but there are also real ones, authentic ones. And for those, he says, we give thanks to God. If I only see problems, I'm a pessimist. If I only see blessings, I'm an optimist. But if I see problems and blessings... And I am thankful for those blessings and focus on those blessings. I'm a spiritual realist. That's a great trait of Christianity, and Paul was was good at that. Now, Paul never visited, as we said last week, Paul never visited the town of Colossae. He did not start the church there. He had never met these new believers face to face. But he had heard enough about them from Epaphras 
to make this assessment that we have just read. And um, these verses give us five traits that make Christians great. And by the way, it's not just true of those in Colossae. This is true of anyone who's a real believer and follower of Jesus Christ. It's true. Um, I could pick anyone, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, Sandy, I'm going to pick on you. Can I do that? Would you come on up here? Uh, this is Santi. He's uh, uh, one of our youth pastors here uh, at Calvary. So, Santi, let me ask you, you ready for a test? I'm going to ask you a few questions. Oh, my goodness. Have you heard the gospel? I have. Okay, when you heard the gospel, did you believe it? I, not at first. Not at first, eventually. but eventually you yes, did. That's did. good because you're a pastor and we want to make sure that you believe. Okay, well, so. Okay. Okay. So, so you heard the gospel. You believed it. Yes. Um, next question. Do you love God's people? I do love. God's you love church people. I do. That's not always easy to do, but you do. I do. Okay. You, so you have a love for God's people. I do. Uh, next question. Um, are you looking forward to going to heaven? I yes, I really am. You were looking for. So you have hope beyond this earth. Yeah. You have hope in heaven. Um, have you ever shared your faith with anyone? Yes. So okay. So you passed the test. Congratulations. You're a great Christian. Now, I could ask any of you who are followers of Jesus those same questions, and I would get similar answers. You heard, you believed, you have love, you have hope, and you are productive. And we want to look at those five here. So what makes Christians so great? First, they're exposed to a great gospel. Now look at verse 5 with me, look at the end of it, the second part of verse 5, where Paul makes note of, you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. They heard a message. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, and then notice in verse 6, which has come to you, verse 6 toward the end, since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth, verse 7, as you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who's a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. So once again, Epaphras was a citizen of Colossae. He went to go hear Paul, the apostle, 80 miles away when Paul was in Ephesus for three years. He liked what he heard. He believed what he heard. It transformed his life. He went back to Colossae and uh, shared the gospel with his, I don't know, family, friends, gas station attendant, guys he works out with at the gym, uh, camel washer, whatever it was. He, he shared his faith with people in that town. And now, because of that, hearing of the message a church has developed. Now, let me give you a couple notes about this before we keep going. The church was started by Epaphras, not Paul. And I just want to let you know that God doesn't always need an apostle to start a church or to get his work done. It's not like, well, you can't do that unless it's sanctioned by the protocols of this organization. You can do whatever God tells you to do. Whatever God calls you to do. The church at Colossae was not started by Paul. It was started by Epaphras. You know, a lot of church planners today, sort of the, the going thing is you develop a social media campaign first, uh, then you get a core group together, and then you have a launch date set, and hopefully in the meantime you raise support so you can, you can go full time. Um, w- when I started this church, I was a, a layman. I worked in the medical field. I got a job in this town and started a Bible study and watched. So I had no clue how to do church. I know some of you are thinking, you still have no clue how to do church. <laughs> well, then to, to God be the glory. Um, so, so it was started by Epaphras, not Paul. God doesn't always need an apostle to do it. Second, I think it would have been a lot easier for Epaphras to stay in Ephesus and not go back home to Colossae. Ephesus is where the action was. That's where Paul was. That's where good teaching happened. That's where a lot of fabulous things were going on. 
But he did go back. We don't exactly know why. It could be just, I feel led to go back home. Or, here's a thought, maybe it was Paul who told him to go back home. I mean, maybe, maybe he said to Paul, hey, Paul, um, I, I've just received your message. Hi, my name's Epaphras. Listen, you've never been to Colossae. That's where I'm from. Why don't you leave Ephesus, come to Colossae, and start a church there? And maybe Paul said, better yet, why don't you go back and start a church? It's burning in your heart. You want to see that happen? I'll pray for it. Go for it. I wouldn't doubt that that happened. In fact, there's a little bit of precedent for that in the New Testament. Remember the guy who was demon-possessed that Jesus delivered, and he begged Jesus that he might be with him, and Jesus said to him, go back home and tell your friends and family the great things God has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And so he went back, and he spoke, and they were exposed to that gospel. That is the word that Paul uses here, the word of the truth of the gospel. Now, that word gospel is used 100 times in the New Testament. 73 of those times, Paul uses it. So other people use it, but Paul loved that word. And you know what the word gospel means. Tell me, what does the word gospel mean? means the good news. Most of us know that. Most Christians know gospel means good news, but that's sort of where we stop in our understanding. What's the good news exactly? The good news is that Jesus solved the problem. That's the good news. The good news is we have a problem. Jesus solved the problem of our sin through his death, burial, and resurrection. That's the gospel in a nutshell. He solved that problem. The gospel, if we want to talk about this in business terminology, the gospel is our product. It's, it's what we do. It's what Christians do. It's what Christians focus on and center on more than anything else. It's the gospel. That's our product. Uh, we're not all about community service, though we do that, and it's important. We're not all about fellowship Though we do that, and that's important. It's not about having a pancake breakfast. We do the gospel. It's about the good news that Jesus solved mankind's problem. It was the gospel that changed Paul's life. It turned him from Saul of Tarsus to Paul the apostle. It made him from a persecutor to a preacher. And consequently, it changed the life of Epaphras and Philemon from this town, and they in turn went back, and they spoke that message, and others heard it, and they were changed. So the first step to a great life in this world is to hear the greatest message in the world, and that's the gospel. Romans chapter 10, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they hear or call on him in whom they have not believed, and how shall they believe in him? of whom they have not heard, and how shall they hear without a preacher? So a preacher gets sent, the preacher preaches, people hear, and that's how the gospel is spread. So this is important, because it tells us that salvation is both a divine work as well as a human work. And it's funny how people kind of want to just get stuck on one side of that balancing equation. Some, it's all God's work. It's predestination. It's election. It is, but it's also evangelism. It's also people speaking the message, speaking the word, preaching the gospel. Uh, you've heard me over the years say this, so it's not new to some of you, but I'm, I'm just going to repeat myself. Um, I have never liked the saying that people seem to fawn all over these days. It goes like this, preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. And people think, oh, that's so cool. It looks so good on a greeting card, you know. It does sound kind of cool. Happens to be wrong. You always need to use words. When somebody says, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words, only reveals that he's embraced a version of Christianity where words don't matter. 
Listen, Jesus did not say go into all the world, period. He said go into all the world and preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. He didn't say go into all the world and hug people and smile at them. Give them a message. Tell them how to get from earth to heaven. Give them accurate instruction. That's what preaching the gospel is. So Epaphras did that. He preached, and people heard the great gospel of Jesus Christ. So that's number one. They're exposed to a great gospel. Second, they experience a great Christ. Once a person hears a message of the truth of the gospel, look at verse 4. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. Now stop there. Once a person hears truth, they either believe it or don't believe it. Or like Santi, you didn't believe it at first, but at some point you believed it. And when you believed it, that was the contact point of salvation. Faith is the contact point when a person believes what they hear in terms of the gospel, they experience salvation. Romans 10 verse 9 If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The Bible says, believe in the name of the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. So, people hear, people believe. But notice something. Go back to our verse and notice that Paul is very specific about the faith that he is referring to. It's objective faith. He didn't say just, we've heard of your faith, but your faith in Christ Jesus. Now, this is very important. And one thing you'll discover in Colossians is that Paul makes a big deal out of Jesus because the false teachers that we talked about last week gave you that background introduction. They were trying to take Jesus away from the preeminent position. So Paul keeps putting him in his rightful place. It's not just faith. It is faith in Christ Jesus. People these days say things like, you just got to have faith. Period. Just got to have faith. Man, you just need to believe. Really? Believe in what? (laughs) Have faith in what? Faith in faith? Faith has no intrinsic value in itself. Faith is only as good as its object. I can place my faith in the universe. A lot of people talk about that. I'm just going to throw it out to the universe, man, and trust the universe. I'm not. You can place your faith in fate, or you can place your faith in humanity. You You can place your faith in a banana peel. They won't help you. Your faith has to be in someone who can actually help you, who can actually fix you. So it's faith in Christ Jesus. So it has to be objective faith in him, but something else. It has to be authentic faith, real faith. I would call it raw faith. It's what Paul said in Romans chapter 10. He said, If you believe in your heart, that means in the core of your being. Uh, Faith doesn't mean to acknowledge. Oh, yes, I acknowledge there is a God. I believe in God in some superficial acknowledgement. Uh, James chapter 2 reminds us even the demons believe like that and they tremble. So to believe in the heart is to really believe. To really believe. It's to be all in, not just superficially, to be all in. So I've always loved this illustration, happens to be true. Uh, In the 1800s, a missionary from Edinburgh, Scotland, uh, went over to uh, a group of South Pacific islands called the New Hebrides uh, Islands. Uh, Now it's called Vanuatu. But at the time, he went, his name was John Patton. John Patton went to those group of islands uh, as a missionary, share the gospel, to see people's lives change. The people who lived on those islands were cannibals. So it made life interesting, to say the least. And he was so committed to this group of people, and he wanted to translate the truths of the New Testament into their language. And he, as he was translating, had problems with one word, that he couldn't find the right 
equivalent in their language, and it was the word believe, the word for faith, the word for trust. He couldn't quite get the right meaning. So one day, he's sitting in his tent or his hut, and uh, he has a, so he's sitting down, I don't know what he was sitting on, certainly not a stage, but uh, he was um, sitting down and he invited a elder to come in, one of the tribe's people, and, and John Patton leaned back in his chair, put his feet up, and he said, okay, to the guy, what am I doing right now? The guy said, what? He goes, what am I doing? Do you have a word in your language that describes what this is? And so he gave him a word in his language that literally means to place all of your weight upon. So when he translated John 3.16, John Patton's version equivalent in that language is this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever places his whole weight on him will not perish but have everlasting life. That's what it means to believe in the New Testament, to place all of your life upon, to really believe from the heart. That's why the, the old King James I love its translation. It says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So the moment you do that, salvation happens. And for some people, it's a very emotional experience. I see people who have come forward, tears in their eyes, filled with remorse for the past. Others come all ecstatic, all happy, uh, sometimes tears of joy. When I came to Christ, I didn't... um, have tears. I didn't uh, get all excited. Uh, I didn't hear a voice or see anything, but I did feel as if the weight of the world was lifted. This huge oppression of weight that was settled on my soul was like lifted. And I went, I can remember it like yesterday. And that was 1973, yo. A long time ago. But that impression of I'm saved. I believe. So hearing and then believing. They're exposed to a great gospel. They experience a great Christ. Third, they exhibit great love. Notice again in verse 4, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints. And then go down to verse 7, as you learn from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who's a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, verse 8, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. So these converts in Colossae had a love for all of God's people, and it was so great that even their pastor bragged about it to Paul the Apostle. And I just want to say, you're brag worthy. I brag about you. Um, As your pastor, I realize that I serve one of the most loving congregations. What I mean by that is whenever there's an opportunity to show God's love, you step up to the plate. And sometimes I feel we give you like way too many opportunities. It's like there's so many things going on, we don't want to tap them for anything else. But whether it's raising money for Ukraine or Afghanistan, or backpacks for kids going back to school who have nothing, or Operation Christmas Child, shoeboxes for decades. You look for those opportunities, and you have always stepped up to the plate because you have a love for God's people and love to see Jesus glorified. So I'm bragging on you, not just here, but elsewhere. But notice, in verse 4, notice that love follows faith. Faith is first followed by love. Why? Because to Paul, faith is proven by love. If you have real faith, it will be demonstrated by love. Now, would you agree with this statement? Love seems pretty absent these days from our world. I don't feel the love, do you? Not a whole lot of it out there. Um... Jesus said the love of many in the last days would grow cold, and I think we're seeing that in spades. Um, It was 1965 when Jackie DeShannon sang a song. Some of you remember that song? Do you remember what song I'm thinking of? What the world needs now is love, 
Sweet love, that's the only thing that there's just too little love. Don't be frightened. That won't happen again. <laughs> but I agree with that. There's not enough love. It is absent from our world. Malcolm Muggeridge said, the biggest disease and the greatest evil today is the lack of love. Now, one of the most notable characteristics of an unsaved person is that they are wrapped up in themselves. And so one of the most notable characteristics of a saved person ought to be that we are wrapped up in the lives of others. I remember a magazine when I was a kid, Life Magazine. Anybody remember Life Magazine? Okay, do you remember when it started? It was 1880, so none of us really would remember. It was, it was a trick question. So I remember growing up with Life Magazine. I loved the pictures. It was a big magazine. And um, uh, as a kid, I'd flip through it. It was all about life, life here, life in different places, letting you know what's going on in life. But then in 1974, another magazine came that eclipsed the subscription even of life, and it was called People Magazine. People Magazine, 1974. Mostly about people, not life as much, just people. And then 1979, another magazine eclipsed that called Self. Do you see a trend here? From life to people to self, I was waiting for the magazine Me to come out. Oh, wait, that's Instagram, isn't it? (laughs) We have all met people who claim to be good Christians but are unloving. I'm a good Christian. Really? We'd do anything to get that look off your face and see some joy and love coming out of that. They're the kind of people Mark Twain had in mind when he said, he's a good man in the worst sort of way. We've all known people like that. But we also know that Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples because you have love for one another. Why is that? Pretty basic. How can we ever share the gospel of God's love unless we love? If we don't love and we're talking to people about God's love, it's just not going to translate. They're going to be out the door never to return. And here's how it works. God is invisible. No one has seen God, the Bible says, at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has revealed Him. So God is invisible, but love somewhat, some way, makes an invisible God visible. 1 John 4, verse 12, no one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us. So they were exposed to a great gospel, they experienced a great Christ, and they exhibited great love. Let me give you a fourth trait that makes Christians great. They expected a great future. They expected a great future. Go to verse 5. Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, at your eventual home, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Now, are you noticing this triad that Paul is so famous for, faith, hope, and love put together? He didn't do this just here. He did it in 1 Thessalonians. The most famous usage of that is 1 Corinthians 13. Now abide faith, hope, love, these three, and the greatest of these is love. Faith, hope, and love is like, to Paul, it's like apostolic shorthand to describe the genuine Christian life. These are three cardinal virtues of our faith. Paul Sometimes puts them in different order. Sometimes it's faith, love, hope. Sometimes it's faith, hope, love. But faith is always first because faith is what produces those other two. I think when Paul uses these three and he tries to work them in, he's looking for a way with words to encompass 
the entire Christian experience. So faith rests on the past, love works in the present, hope looks to the future. So our faith has produced love, but not just love, we realize we, we have a hope that goes beyond this life waiting for us in heaven. Have you ever thought about it? We, we, no, let, me, let me state it differently. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is the greatest organization in the world. Once again, the church of Jesus Christ is the greatest organization in the world. Let me explain. Number one, our product works universally. We can preach the gospel in any country of the world, any language, any era, and lives will get changed. Our product works universally. Uh, second, we have a pretty awesome benefits package. I get forgiven of all my past sins. I get, I get uh, peace and joy and all that that comes with it, purpose. But third, the retirement package is literally out of this world, in heaven, the best ever. So we have a hope that goes beyond today or tomorrow or next week or when I get my pension check or gold watch from the company. It goes beyond this life. Remember what Paul said? If we have hope in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most miserable. But we have a greater hope than just this world. Now, unsaved people do not have this hope. The hope they have is right here, on this earth, in this world. It's all they got. So if you wonder, why are these people so mean and selfish and focused on themselves? This is all they have. It's all they, that's why they don't want to let go of anything, because there's nothing after this. Uh, let me just say to you, if you're an unbeliever this morning... First of all, I hope you come to your senses and you receive Christ and get forgiven and get hope and get peace and all that we're talking about. But you might be the kind who said, nope, not me. I'm never going to be converted. You're never going to get me, preacher. I'll come with my wife or I'll come with my kids or I'll get drugged, but I'm digging. I'm not going to respond ever. If that is your heart, let me just say to you, if that's where you're at, then you better milk this world for all you can. You better suck it dry like an orange and get every last drop of fun and satisfaction because this is it. After this life is over, last good time you'll ever have. That's why I say I'm praying and hoping that you'll have a change of heart and you'll have a hope that is beyond this earth. Now, I mentioned the world doesn't have much hope. A New York research group made this statement. Most Americans are unhappy with their lives. Wow. Most Americans are unhappy with their lives. The thing about that statement, it was spoken a few years ago before COVID. Before the pandemic, most Americans are unhappy with their lives. Do you think it's gotten better since the pandemic? Has, has the hope gone up or down since then? It's gone down, I think. I was asking on my pastoral team this week, I said, what have you noticed in counseling since the pandemic, uh, since the last couple years and now that the pandemic is uh, largely over, what, what, what do you notice in terms of your counseling? What kind of issues? And I said, people are filled with anxiety more than we've seen it. People are filled with fear and despondency and hopelessness lack of confidence more than ever before. It's like, we didn't, we didn't expect a pandemic, and that happened, so anything else can happen now. You know, sky is falling kind of a thing. Um, according to a Gallup poll, 2021 was the most unhappy year on record. 2021, the most unhappy year on record. According to Gallup's Negative Experience Index. I didn't even know there was such a thing as a Negative Experience Index. Did you, Chip? I, I, this is the first time I heard about it. But there is one now. 
According to Gallup's negative experience index, the world experienced more negative emotions in 2021 than any other year the study was conducted. This world is pretty desperate for hope. When you hear the message of the gospel and you believe it, love is generated and hope, you should have so much hope for your future. And then finally, and we close with this, what makes them great? They exported great fruit. Verse 6, which has come to you as it also has in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. It's fruitful. The Christian life is not Static. It is not stagnant. It is not just a system of ethics. It's not just a religious ideology. It is living. It is moving. It is growing. It is fruitful. The gospel produces inward transformation. That is the love and the hope that is mentioned. It produces outward benefit. That is the fruit. I don't know exactly what kind of fruit Paul has in mind because he's already mentioned uh, love and hope, those sound like, sounds like fruit to me, but what I think he has in mind, by the way this is worded, is simply he is referring to the replicating nature of the gospel message, that wherever it goes, it grows, it spreads, new converts are being won. It's Paul's way of saying Christianity is spreading everywhere. So it's come to you, Colossians, and it's also now come through you to other people in your town and in your family. I mean, think about this. What began as a despised movement led by a crucified Jew in an obscure section of a despised land by the Roman government became the most dominant religious system of the Roman Empire by the fourth century AD. That's growth, that's fruit. The message was dropped in different places, and it spread like wildfire. So they heard it, they were changed by it, and now they're spreading it around, being fruitful. That makes Christians great. Now, I want to close with this thought. Remember the parable Jesus spoke about, the parable of the merchant that found a pearl and it was so valuable that he sold everything he had to buy the pearl. A little parable in Matthew 13. I'm not going to talk about the different interpretive views of that. But there was an author who helps us understand this whole idea of the faith we're talking about. Right? This all-in faith. This lean into it and, and put your whole weight on kind of a faith. Here it is. I want this pearl. How much is it? Well, the seller says, it's very expensive. But how much, we ask? Well, a very large amount. Well, do you think I could buy it? Oh, of course. Everyone can buy it. But didn't you just say it was very expensive? Oh, yes. Well, how much is it? Everything you have, says the seller. Well, we make up our minds. All right, I really want it. I'll buy it, we say. Well, what do you have? He wants to know. Let's write it down. Well, I have $10,000 in the bank. Good. $10,000. What else? Well, that's all. That's all I have. Nothing more? Well, I have a few dollars here in my pocket. How much? We start digging. Well, let's see, 30, 40, 60, 80, 100, $120. That's fine. What else do you have? Well, nothing. That's all. Well, where do you live? He's still probing. Well, in my house. Yeah, I have a house. The house, too, then. He writes that down. You mean I have to live in my camper? Oh, you have a camper. That too. What else? Man, I'll have to sleep in my car. Oh, you have a car. Yeah, I have two of them. Both of them become mine. 
Both cars, what else? Well, you already have my money, my house, my camper, my cars. What more do you want? Well, are you alone in this world? No, I have a wife and two children. Oh, yes, your wife and children too. What else? I have nothing left. I'm left alone now. Suddenly the seller exclaims, Oh, I almost forgot. You, yourself, too. Everything becomes mine. Wife, children, house, money, cars, and you, too. Then he goes on. Now listen. I will allow you to use all of these things for the time being, but don't forget that they're all mine, just as you are. And whenever I need any of them, you must give them up because now I am the owner. That, that describes this, right? Right? Put your whole Wait your whole life, your whole future on him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. And you go, well, I'm giving up so much. No, you're getting love, you're getting hope, and a whole list of other benefits we haven't even touched on. You're getting heaven in exchange for what you deserve. You're getting God's grace and God's goodness free. Free, it cost me so much. No, he gave everything. He was all in to go to the cross. He gave his life for you. He's asking you to live for him. Live an abundant life for his glory. Father, thank you for this incredible paragraph, this one single sentence in Greek that is six verses in our Bible, this paragraph of beautiful truth that shows us what is so great about the Christian life. We have a great gospel, a great Christ. You've given us great love for each other. We have great hope in the future, and you make our lives productive to bless and help others to get them from earth to heaven. Father, I just want to pray for anyone who might be here who has never surrendered. Maybe they assent. Maybe they acknowledge. Maybe they have superficially thought, I believe in God, but they have never committed. So, Father, we pray that you'll bring them to that place this morning, today. You change lives you change lives in, in grocery stores when the gospel is preached, in tents, in battlefields, in houses of parliament and government, in churches, in stadiums. Wherever that message is heard and believed that God loved people enough to solve the sin problem by sending Jesus to die on their behalf, get buried and get, then rise from the dead, conquering death, giving us hope that there is life after death. So, Father, I pray for anyone who is not really committed yet, who happens to be among us, that you would just prompt them to make that point of contact by believing. If you're here this morning and you're willing to do that, to believe in Jesus Christ, to trust him as Lord and Savior, maybe you've never done that in that way, Maybe you had something that happened to you in the past that was some spiritual thing, but you're not obeying him today. You're not walking with him. You're not experiencing that, and you need to come back home. If that describes you with our heads bowed and eyes closed, would you just raise your hand in the air just for a moment? Raise it up so I can see it. Just raise it up high. Just put it up. Say, Skip, here I am. Pray for me. God bless you. Over to my right. Right there in the middle. Yep. In the back. Just pop that hand up. Just say, Skip, over here, pray for me. I just want to acknowledge you. Thank you. God bless you. If you're outside, would you just raise your hand? There's a pastor or two out there who will acknowledge you in the family room. Father, thank you for the gospel, the good news. 
you invaded history with a message that continues to change lives, change these lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand to your feet, please? We're going to sing this final song, and I'm going to ask those of you who raised your hand. If you were in the family room, I want you to leave the family room and come through the doors, which is right up to the front, to the right in the family room, and then come right up here. If you raise your hand in this room, would you find the nearest aisle and just stand right up here. I'm going to lead you in a prayer when you get up here to say yes to Jesus. We're going to do business with God right now. So if you raise your hand, no matter where you are in the back, please uh, let us be a part of this with you and encourage you in this. Just come right up to the front. Don't be afraid. It's just us. Come stand right up here. Come on up. Yeah. I saw hands going up on the right side, on the left side, in the back. If you're on the outside, if you're outside in the amphitheater and you raise your hand, a pastor is going to direct you in. So we're going to wait for anybody who might be outside or in the family room. Awesome. Come on, welcome. Glad you're here. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. So we do this publicly like this, never to embarrass anyone, but to encourage everyone who makes this decision. Uh, Jesus called people publicly. We think it's important to make a public declaration like this. It does something to an individual when they're willing to stand up publicly and say, I'm recommitting my life to Christ, coming back to him, or for the first time, really trusting him. It does something uh, inside of us that helps cement that. So that's why we think it's important. Is there anyone else? Maybe you've watched this on several occasions, but you yourself have not participated and God has been working at you or drawing you. You get up and come. Get up and, and feel the love and the release and forgiveness uh, that comes at the foot of the cross. Anyone else? Come now. Yes. Amen. Welcome. Welcome. Okay, let's get down to business. I'm going to lead you in. Let's get a little closer. Okay, this is a. This, we're family now. We're just about. So uh, I'm going to pray out loud, and I'm going to ask you to pray out loud after me. Say these words from your heart. You're saying them to God. Just say, God, I give you me. I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me. I believe in Jesus. I believe he died for me. I believe he shed his blood for me. I believe he rose again. I turn from my past. I repent of my sin. I turn to Jesus as Savior and Master. Fill me with love and hope and fruit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Don't go. Don't go. Come, come this way, Kevin. This guy here, I know it's hard to believe, but he's a man of God. He's a pastor. I love you, Kevin. Would you follow Kevin and our team right over this way into a little room just for a few moments? Thank you so much for joining us for this message from Calvary Church. We would love to know how this message impacted you. Share your story with us. Email mystory at calvarynm.church. And if you'd like to support this Bible teaching ministry with a financial gift, 
visit calvarynm.church/give